From advertising to software as a service to data. Across all of our programs and clients, we've seen a 55 to 65 percent open rate. Getting brands authentically integrated into content performs better than TV advertising. Typical lifespan of an article is about 24 to 36 hours. If we're reaching out to the right person with the right message and a clear call to action, then it's just a matter of timing. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast, and I hear everything production. In this podcast, you'll hear the stories of world-class marketers that use technology to drive business results and achieve career success. We'll unearth the real-world experiences of some of the brightest minds in the marketing and technology space so you can learn the tools, tips, and tricks they've learned along the way. Now here's the host of the MarTech Podcast, Benjamin Shapiro. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast. I'm Benjamin Shapiro, the executive producer of the MarTech Podcast, and today we've got a special episode for you, which is going to be guest hosted by Juan Mendoza, the author of the MarTech Weekly Newsletter. Juan is a recovering MarTech consultant turned creator who writes an amazing weekly newsletter about the MarTech industry. And I'm thrilled to invite him and some of his friends to take the mic and share their knowledge with you, our loyal MarTech Podcast listeners. All right, here's a special episode of the MarTech Podcast, guest hosted by Juan Mendoza, the author of the MarTech Weekly Newsletter. Hello, hello, marketers. My name is Juan Mendoza. I am from the MarTech Weekly. And today we're going to assess the role of the CMO, the Chief Marketing Officer. Joining me today is Jeremy Haft. He's the Chief Revenue Officer at Digital Remedy. They're a performance media partner for brands and agencies providing effective solutions to drive success in the digital advertising space. Yesterday, Jeremy and I talked about the evolving role of the CMO. And today, we're going to continue this conversation by asking, what do CMOs need to do to measure success in the evolving digital landscape where we've inundated with so many data points? What should CMOs be focusing on in terms of their success and what they should be reporting on? So here's our next conversation with Jeremy Haft, the Chief Revenue Officer at Digital Remedy. Great to have you back, Jeremy. So good to have you. And our conversation yesterday was fascinating, talking about balancing the creative and the data analytical skills in the CMO suite. But I want to sort of shift our conversation now into metrics, measurement, part of this digital transformation that's happening in the CMO department right now has a lot to do with data and analytics and using it effectively. So let's kick off and get straight into our conversation. How do traditional marketing metrics such as return on investment, customer acquisition costs, things like conversion rate, things like reach and impressions and CPM and all these different metrics, how do they need to evolve to accurately measure the success of CMOs? What do you say to CMOs in terms of the things they should be measuring in their business? Awesome. Well, Juan, thank you so much for having me on your show again. It was great chatting with you yesterday interesting, you know, as we were talking about the accountability aspects and how the CMO is reporting now into the CFO from, are you driving growth for our business? I think it's one of the things that the word performance, right? The big P word means so many different things to so many people. But as I continue to have conversations with CMOs, heads of brand, very senior leadership within some of these very large organizations, the new buzzword that I continue to hear is effectiveness, how is this media, how is this marketing, how is this advertising driving effectiveness for the overarching brand? And what that means is how do we ensure that while we're spending minimally on our current customers, right? Because we know they're going to come back. We know that their habitual buyers are the ones that are going to buy, whether it's a good, you know, and they need to refill every two months, right? And we know they're going to. How do we continue to stay consistent with them, but then really focus our efforts on incrementality? How are we driving incremental value and net new people into our services and our goods? And I think that's one of the things of how are we showing marketing effectiveness into our buying and our, our paid on and earned media strategies. Can you break down incrementality? How do you define that? So the way in which we define incrementality is what is the value of being able to drive net new audiences, net new eyeballs, increase addressability, find those new conversions outside of who the brand is already reaching and messaging and activating again. For example, let's say they're getting conversions by way of different media channels, such as let's call it search and social. 
How do we not waste our time on folks that we know are going to convert in a search and social capacity, but reach them in other media channels, whether that be online video, connected TV, OTT, out of home, right? All these other media channels that you now have the ability, which historically you weren't able to, to connect back to an IP address and be able to fully understand if somebody was exposed, how they're exposed, and if they actually drove incremental value on the conversion for the brand. The incrementality aspect of this is really fascinating to me because there is a lot of changes across the landscape of tracking and analytics and attribution. Incrementality is one of those options. You know, there's MMM, media mix modeling, which is another format of measurement. And then you've got, say, last click or second last click attribution from when a user clicks from a website to a page and they do something measuring that sort of last mile in the journey of that customer experience. And search always wins. And search always wins because when people are actually looking to buy the thing, that's like the tip of the iceberg of all of the other considerations, actions, channel touch points. But I guess the incrementality is challenging because you want to get a view of like, well, what channels are contributing to the entire picture here? The user, maybe they clicked on three email campaigns and then they sort of search ad and then they visit the website three times. And the problem with that is that all of those interactions, every single customer has a different bundle of interactions before they buy something. And a lot of that is offline as well. I bought something the other day because a friend of mine recommended it. So there's so much we don't know that's so mysterious to which channels are actually driving the performance for a brand. But as you say, that incrementality, which customers are new, which ones are coming in new versus which are repeat is a great place to start. Well, it's what's coming in new, but then how did they get there? And I think with how do we have that direct, whether it's the partners that the brand is actually partnering with to be able to activate, but then also the direct connection that the brand is able to get with those potentially new audiences as well. And how are we able to understand and really provide that exposure? And I think when you're getting to is like, how are other media channels impacting somebody's likelihood to search? Because let's say, for example, we serve four CTV ads and then a display ad and online video ad. And then all of a sudden, somebody's like, let me search for this brand, click, boom, buy. We want to make sure that we understand that consumer journey and then weight all the variable touch points that the consumer had so that people can understand. Because this is also going to help with creative strategy, creative messaging, the omni-channel approach that a marketer is going to take to be able to drive what that ideal outcome is that they're looking for. I guess in terms of an example that you can give us where you've just seen so clearly that whole pipeline of they've got their data, they've been able to manage it and clean it and use it where they can find real insights about their customers. And then that leap, you know, like it, I often see that a lot of insights die in a PowerPoint and slide 96 <laughs> at the end of a marketing presentation. It's like so many insights actually just end up in the waste bin, never to be actioned, never to be explored or experimented with out of a lot of the marketing analysis that you see in the industry. So if we continue that example of, okay, they had the data that's clean, it's ready to use, it's being reported on, and there's insights, there's real insights, and then that jump to a business strategy or a marketing strategy or a campaign or an experiment. Have you got a story of a CMO or a marketing leader following that through just so beautifully executed and led to a real outcome? Yes, and I think it's a risk, but it's a calculator risk, we'll call it is a lot of your D to C type brands, your growth brands, because they're the ones that are heavily focused on that ROI. They're heavily focused on if I put a dollar in, am I getting $3 out? But I need to understand how. I know that my audience is not necessarily, depending on the skew in the demo, right? It's also, I know where my audience is. I know how I need to reach them. But do I have the ability to get the data back to be able to tell the story that this is where I need to spend the money? And I think that's where the ability of, modern ad technology today to be able to triangulate and understand audiences, are they going into a store or are they not? Do I double down? Is a way in which that marketer is able to communicate effectively that their marketing strategy is working. I'll give you an example of also not only D2C brands that we've been talking to that know their audiences are heavily focused on connected TV and they know they need to spend there, right? Because it's the cord cutters, the cord stackers, the cord nevers those that are not on traditional linear and anything that there's content that they're watching and absorbing is streaming. So they want to make sure that they're getting their message out where it can't be skipped, but they also want to see if it's actually working to drive ROI. We also work with a very large QSR, a quick serve restaurant. 
And again, this is something where they knew they needed to heavily invest into CTV because that's where their audience was. But they weren't even sure whether or not it was actually driving effectiveness for their business. It turns out, due to the fact of being able, again, triangulating IP address, device IDs, people going in store, leveraging the loyalty card data as well, we can actually now start seeing transaction and somebody exposed, right? And it showed a crazy like 17,000% increase ROI on their investments. What do they do, they're like, this worked, we need to continue to double down, continue to invest, where we're able to give that story and give that data back to the marketers. They can go back to their CMO and say, hi, look at what we were able to do with this minimal amount of money, which gave now the confidence for that marketer to then go back to find and say, we're actually gonna double down next year because if it can grow our business this much, actually prove that it's getting new eyeballs, new people, new audiences into our stores and purchasing product, because you don't go into QSR to a quick serve restaurant to just schmooze around and look at what's on the shelves, right? You're going there to purchase food and then you're leaving or you're eating it there. So they know they're going to see MTRI once somebody goes in, which gives them now the confidence to continue to spend because they're actually seeing the tangible outcome of the business. What are your thoughts on CTV? It seems that we're having a bit of a revolution in that space. TV has always been notoriously, to put it politely, not great with actual measurement, you know, even the reach and ratings and things like that. It's always been a bit archaic and ancient in traditional TV, but CTV seems to have a really powerful role in both the brand reach and that recall because it, obviously it's video and its commercials are so ingrained in most TV viewing preferences. But CTV seems far more measurable than your traditional counterparts. Are you seeing that as well, like CMOs leveraging CTV because it's measurability? Oh, this is the chicken or the egg, Juan. Well, I just became a cord cutter myself about a year ago. What's a cord cutter? So historically, linear TV, cable boxes, right, that powered, you know, as you were watching, and a cord cutter is something that cuts the cable cord. So then you're just using a streaming service, like so YouTube TV or a Roku or... Apple TV or what have you to actually tune into and select the live TV content that you want to watch. What's interesting about it, especially in the States, linear TV is powerful. It's normally the foundation of a marketing plan. And sometimes it changes, sometimes it doesn't. It's really the rocks at the bottom, the basement holding the entire foundation of a media plan up. I think it's an extremely powerful tool. You brought up MMM earlier, earlier or yesterday, I can't remember. But one of the things that was interesting about MMM is how it weights all your different media within the mix. One of the things that I've noticed in the conversations happen, and depending on who the CMO is, the evolving or the traditional CMO, and then you have your brand managers. They know how many GRPs they need to buy every year in order to hit a certain threshold of success so their business pushes enough goods or services off the shelf. Do they want to change that and risk that with something else, even though the entire business and digital landscape is evolving and changing? Not necessarily because it's also job security, knowing that if I buy X GRPs, I'm good to go. I think that's one of the things that we're constantly starting to play a little tug of war with because of the tonnage and the awareness element of linear TV. But the big challenge of it is how does it actually help me understand a deeper rooted performance or effectiveness understanding of my business? That's fantastic. And I think it's so pertinent right now, as you say, that for a lot of, particularly with consumer brands like TV, linear and now increasingly CTV is that foundation of the entire activation, like the brand, the messaging, the positioning, the product, all of that stuff kind of sits there. And that's the first sort of tranche of creative that goes out. And then it's followed up by the more tactical options, right? And, you know, I think that the Super Bowl is a really good example of those foundations being built year on year, you know? It's almost where like in TV, advertising in particular, the Super Bowl is kind of like a reset for the rest of the year, you know, in that, oh, okay, cool, this is our messaging. And then if it resonates, you know, and they, they got really go for it and it continues to drive growth and they'll execute that across other channels as well. But I guess I want to shift a little bit in terms of, we talked about the execution, the creative, and some of the ideas, but what about the cross-functional aspect of this? It's not marketers and CMOs, they're doing everything. It's their analytics, their data engineering teams, it's their product, their sales teams. How do you see the, the CMO department facilitating that across uh, those different roles around analytics and measurement? Does a CMO have some form of alignment role there or how do you see it? 
I think something that's interesting in my role here at Digital Remedy, uh, oversee sales, marketing, client services, solutions engineering, and taking on the marketing department. While I am not a CMO, we don't have one, but I'm, I guess, the part acting CMO to help support our amazing marketing team as they really help grow and build this organization to be a brand within market. One of the things that we continue to talk about is using data to tell a story, to show how one of the campaigns that we're running or something that we are sponsoring or events, or how are we using our own data to inform how we're activating our own media to drive new customers in-house is actually helping drive ROI, right? Because when I go talk to our CEO and the board from a marketing perspective and our leads and how we've grown our audience and users and our clients, our own customers, right? How did they get here? Did they get here through a paid media strategy? And it's really getting buy-in from all the different departments and having the right folks within the marketing department work with the right folks within the revenue operations department within an organization to be able to actually tie everything together to tell that story of, did I actually drive effectiveness through my marketing campaigns so that you can go back and get more money to spend as a marketer? It's so fascinating in that analytics and reporting is that linchpin to the next business case. Yeah, I mean, because again, at the end of the day, right, if I was to just go to our head of finance and say, hi, I want to spend another million dollars here because it works. Well, the next question is like, well, what worked? How much money did we get from it, right? And not even how much money, but did it help shorten the sales cycle, right? That's even a better. That drives revenue quicker for an, a massive organization, whether it be ours or, you know, a big CPG. As well. When it comes to analytics, reporting and data, I think the mental trap that a lot of marketing leaders get into is that there's a right way to do that. Oh, you need these metrics and you need to line them in this way. And they're going to use a PowerPoint template to present their outcomes. And increasingly, as I work with marketing leaders all over the place, it's actually not about that at all. It's actually about what does the executive team, the people that you're asking money from, what do they believe is valuable? And how do you align your reporting with those values? Some corporations are just extremely pragmatic. They're money in, money out. Okay, you promised us X, did you get X? What's our year on year increase in revenue? What's our X and Y thing? Oh, did this channel actually drive those sales? It's extremely pragmatic. Whereas other corporations can be very flexible. They'll say, oh, we're spending millions of dollars a year on big brand campaigns and reaching a lot of people and no direct attribution. And it's unclear exactly how much that's leading to sales. And they're totally comfortable with that because they realize and recognize the value of mass marketing and brand marketing that doesn't initially correspond to sales. And so often it's a worldview question when it comes to analytics. And I'm interested in your thoughts in that. Is that is that something that you encounter is that different executive teams want different things from the marketing reporting and marketers need to pivot around that? It's interesting because the day that my company says to me, oh, it's cool if you just spend millions of dollars on mass awareness, I think I'll be absolutely shocked. <laughs> okay. You just run do it right before they ask any more questions. But all kidding aside, I, I was talking to a dear friend of mine this morning on my commute into to work. And one of the things that they were speaking about, and they work for a very massive consumer packaged goods company. And the big focus is on how do we get the same thing or more for less money, right? How do we drive our costs down on our media marketing? And those are a lot of the conversations that I'm hearing now. You know, I go back to the effect of this conversation. I'm not hearing a lot of the legacy traditional route of marketing from, and this, you know, go full circle from our conversation yesterday. While art is part of the conversation, it's more about the science and what I'm saying. And if you think about it like 10 years ago, the 80-20 rule of like 80% with art and 20% science, I look at today that flip and I think it's 80% science and art because it's what is the data, what is the analytics, what are the insights, what is it telling us to inform our strategy so we move forward and drive growth for our business. Well, I like that perspective. And I guess that that's the advantage is that now we're in this space where things are far more measurable. The CMOs that can actually get there and use it effectively and have that clarity of just going to far outpace the other brands or their competitors in the set as well. So that wraps up our MarTech Insider episode of the MarTech Podcast with Jeremy Haft. He's the Chief Revenue Officer at Digital Remedy. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to get in touch with Jeremy, you can find his LinkedIn profile in our show notes, or you can visit the company website at 
www.digitalremedy.com. Jeremy, so great to talk with you. Juan, it was wonderful. Thank you so much for having me on your episode again. Okay, that wraps up this episode of the MarTech Podcast. Thanks to our guest host, Juan Mendoza, the author of the MarTech Weekly Newsletter. If you'd like to get in touch with Juan, you can find a link to his LinkedIn profile in our show notes, or you can contact him on Twitter. His handle is Juan Mendoza, but it's spelled crazy pants. It's J-U-4-N-M-E-N-D-0-Z-4. Or it's a little easier to just visit his company's website, which is themartechweekly.com. Just one more link in our show notes I'd like to tell you about. If you didn't have a chance to take notes while you were listening to this podcast, head over to martechpod.com where we have summaries of all of our episodes and contact information for our guests. You can also subscribe to our weekly newsletters and you can even send us your topic suggestions or your marketing questions, which we'll answer live on our show. Of course, you can always reach out on social media. Our handle is martechpod, M-A-R-T-E-C-H-P-O-D on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Or you can contact me directly. My handle is Ben J. Shap, B-E-N-J-S-H-A-P. And if you haven't subscribed yet and you want a daily stream of marketing and technology knowledge in your podcast feed, we're going to publish an episode every day this year. So hit the subscribe button in your podcast app and we'll be back in your feed tomorrow morning. All right, that's it for today. But until next time, my advice is to just focus on keeping your customers happy. 